Yeah. It's good. <laughs> okay. So uh, we'll move on to um, uh, maybe the, uh, the only part of this story uh, that I've actually contributed something. No, well, you can write your own reviews. <laughs> so, uh, so this is about uh, this whole business that we've already alluded to many times, where we are trying to view uh, non-abelian homology in a geometric way. So I think I'm repeating various notations, but again, X is just a smooth curve, and if you are worried about various... Um, issues of weightings of cohomology and so on. You can assume it's a compact curve as well. That's what we're mostly interested in. And U is my notation now for the QP unipotent et tau fundamental group, which everybody understands now. And subscript N is the, the uh, um, quotient modulo of the lower central series filtration. So uh, I, I, don't, I, I think I messed up the slides and didn't use the notation very uh, consistently, but I'll denote by G various Galois groups, local Galois groups, or uh, um, Galois groups of uh, restricted ramification field extension, like this one, Q sub T, given a finite collection of primes. Hmm. So the beginning of this construction of, view, of viewing non-abelian cohomology as a space will follow, as, as, oh, this is at least a baby version of this Grotendieck philosophy that we first define a functor. We want to end up with a scheme over QP, right? <clears throat> so I'll first define a functor of QP algebras, right? What's the functor? It just associates to a QP algebra this cohomology set. So I've just written the definition again, but remember that the Z1 just refers to one co-cycles, functions from G to the R points of U, right? Uh, so again, I'm, I'm being slightly inconsistent. Sometimes I write U, sometimes I write U sub N, depending. Of, of course, we'll be mostly interested in this specific finite dimensional quotient U sub N, but sometimes I roll it all together and think about U all at once. But anyways, these are f f continuous functions that satisfy this co-cycle condition, and then modulo this equivalence relation given by the points of U that sends a co-cycle to a kind of twisted conjugate co-cycle like this. Okay. Now, then you have to say various things. Uh, the most important thing, which is, like, ends up being very elementary, but was tricky when I first thought about it, was to say what I mean by continuous. Yeah? So one needs to say continuous. And also, the other thing is, I have to say what I mean by the Galois action on this for a QP algebra R. And the answer to the second question is that the action on R is trivial. So that's the idea. So how does one think about this? There are various approaches, but one way to do it, this is a good idea, not a bad idea in general. That when you think about this unipotent fundamental growth, right? As any uh, finite dimension unipotent uh, algebraic group can be thought of as just being its Lie algebra as a scheme. So it's an affine space over QP given by its Lie algebra via the log map. And then when you think about it as, Lie, as its Lie algebra, then U itself is the Lie algebra together with this group structure given by this Campbell-Hausdorff formula, which for a finite dimension or unipotent group like this actually terminates after finitely many terms. So you don't have to worry you know, about any power series. So we'll, for now, the approach that I'll take is really think about U and as being the affine scheme given by its Lie algebra. And then from that point of view, when I write U and R, that's just L and tensored with R simply. Those are the R points of that scheme. So, so and viewed in this way, the Galois action just acts on the left factor and acts trivially on the right. So that's the Galois action on the R points. Uh, that's necessary to define the code cycles. And then the second point is that <coughs> UN already, uh, as, uh, as appeared in the previous slide, since it's the algebra, it's just an affine space. So UNR is just R to the N for some N, right? So, and you can compute that dimension as well. But uh, uh, now, I said we need to, do, why, why am I doing this? Because I need to speak about continuous code cycles, right? From the Galois group to these R points. So what is the continuous? Well, 
Uh, what you put on here is simply the inductive limit topology of finite dimensional QP subspaces. R itself is a QP algebra, so it may be infinite dimensional, it usually is. It's very large. It might be a polynomial algebra or something. So then, but over QP, there's this fact that on any finite dimensional QP vector space, there's a unique topology, right, compatible with its vector space structure. And so, on any finite dimensional subspace of any QP algebra, there's a unique topology determined by the QP topology, and R is just a union of all those things, so just put the inductive limit topology on R, as well as on all R to the nth power. One thing you have to be careful about is that the inductive limit topology on R to the n is not the product topology of R. Yeah. Both separately have inductive limit topology from finite dimensional sub subspaces. Right, so that, uh, and you do the same thing for all of these quotients, uh, graded quotients, modulo the lower central series. And now, I, I guess I've defined, therefore, explained the terms. So, uh, sorry, maybe I should briefly go back to this slide. So, <clears throat> that Z1 with all these definitions just are the co-cycles in, in, the, in the sense I already said. These are continuous maps from G to UR that satisfy this condition with respect to the Galois action, okay? I think explain everything is defined now. <clears throat> right. Now, with this definition, the elementary proposition, which is still an amusing exercise to try, is that if you take HI now with coefficients in UN mod UN plus 1. So here, for this, I can be any, any I. Why? Because when, when you take this associated gradient thing, remember, these are all just vector groups. So the, you can, uh, the cohomology exists in any degree. For the whole thing, for the whole non abelian thing, we're only considering H0 and H1. But for these associated gradient things, you have every i, and you can give the same discussion. And if you define it the way we just did, co-cycles, i co-cycles with values in, 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 this, in this group, modulo the co-boundaries, then in fact that turns out to be just the QP cohomology tensored with R. So this is an elementary fact, but still rather amusing to try to prove. So in other words, this functor of R is just represented by this vector space. That's all we're saying. This functor of R is represented by the vector space. Why do I bother then defining the functor of R in that way? Why not just this way? You could do that if you're just interested in this graded piece. Here. But for the whole UN, this doesn't make sense. That's why we just defined it first as co-cycles modulo co-boundaries. Okay, but at the abelian level, at each graded thesis, it turns out to be the obvious thing. This definition gives you a representable functor. And then using this, you can represent the whole thing. <clears throat> so it's elementary, but still, for me, it's rather amusing. So the theorem, that is, is that this functor that we just defined is represented by an affine QP scheme of finite type that represents principal UN bundles with continuous G actions. You have to say a little bit carefully what that representation means, but okay, we won't bother too much. We're mostly interested in the QP points. So the proof is by induction on N, and it's, uh, it's basically this. So, if you, um, so you need to prove that there is such an exact sequence and what does this exact sequence mean for non abelian cohomology? So, for example, it says that for every R, the image of this map is the kernel of that delta. Kernel meaning what? It's the inverse image of the origin. <laughs> it's not a group, so you have to say what you mean by kernel, right? So it means just the inverse image of the origin inside this H2 uh, is, uh, uh, as a subspace of H1 is the image of the previous level. Well, sorry, not previous level, one higher level. So that's one statement. And secondly, another aspect of the exactness is that then this H1 maps to the kernel of delta. And in fact, that H1 over there for the associated grade pieces, remember that is a vector group. So that's just R to the N for some N. And the statement when I say this is exact is saying that, that this middle thing is a torsor over the, over the kernel of delta acted on by that vector group. That's the precise statement. Okay. So these all require a little bit of understanding of the Galois action, but you deduce this exact sequence, and now the representability is easy, because you see that H1 there and this H2 here are all representable by vector groups. That's what I said just a moment ago, right? <clears throat> now, so you've, if you've represented this H1, you have to check then that that delta is functorial in R. 
But that's also easy. This is all this general nonsense regarding the way you define uh, various, uh, uh, going back to your standard long exact sequences, these are all functorial. So because that delta is functorial in R, then once these are represented, it's actually a map of schemes. Any map of functors between schemes is actually a map of schemes. So, <clears throat> so then you can define the kernel of delta as a subscheme of H1. Then that middle thing is, an eight, is a torsor for that H1 over the kernel of delta as a subscheme. But it's all, every, everything inside is an affine scheme. For, so torsors for vector groups all split. So in fact, that middle thing is represented by kernel delta just cross that thing, that kernel, that thing that's acting. So that's all there is to this representation. Now let me say a word about why I'm saying scheme is because this kernel of delta a priori may not be a variety, it may not be reduced. So, and I didn't care about it when I first started, was writing about these things because I was mostly interested in QP points, in which case it's just uh, only depends on the reduced subscheme, right? Which can be counted as a variety as long as you don't care about irreducibility. But then at some point I had to think about tangent spaces to these things in which case you have to consider whether it's a scheme or not. Maybe it's just a variety anyway. I'm not completely sure still, but the a priori it's a scheme. And that's all there is to the representability. Um, so it's, maybe I'll make one more remark. So if you look at it, uh, uh, I think initially when I first stated the representability of this, uh, this, uh, this functor, uh, there was a lot of skepticism because this is a moduli space for a unipotent group. In particular, remember when I constructed a Z1 modulo U, you're taking a quotient modulo a unipotent group. So geometric invariant theory is supposed to not work very well for unipotent growth, but it works here because of this Galois action. The twisting of the, of the action via the Galois group allows you to get rid of the usual problem concerning stabilizers <coughs> and so on. Okay. <clears throat> now, so now the, another part that I'll go over very quickly in the order to define this H1 sub F, you have to do the local version where the G is now the local Valois group together with this B Chris coefficient, this periodic Hodge theory coefficient. So for any R, you can look at the UN, the points of UN in B Chris tensor R. So that's another QP algebra, right? So there's no problem defining that and consider cohomology exactly in the way defined a moment ago. And then, yeah, with respect to that functor, you can define H1 sub F simply to be the kernel of the map from H, the H1 just defined to H1 of this Chris version, P Chris version. That way, you define H1 sub F as a subscheme. So, if you say, say it in words in the, in the language of torsors, so these are the principal bundle for UN, which trivialize when you, base, when, you, when, you, when you push out to be UN, be Chris, meaning once you go out to be N Chris, be Chris, uh, when you, once you go to B Chris points, it should have a Galois invariant point. That's what it is to be to trivial, remember. So these are the things that have a Galois invariant point. Once you could look at the B Chris points, those are the H1 sub Fs. <coughs> um, and then uh, f f uh, finally, there's this localization from the global thing to the local thing, and then you can take the fiber product or the inverse image of the subscheme H1 sub F to get the global H1 sub F. So these are the main things that I worked with, but I should comment that there are many other subschemes you can consider. Yeah? So for example, you can put more local conditions at places in T, which is what uh, Nathan and Alex have been studying very carefully, and they have very nice results on how to describe the further refined subschemes of H1 sub S by putting in more conditions. So here, the only conditions are outside of T, it's actually unramified, that's implicitly inside the definition, and at P, it, it, has, it satisfies this crystalline condition, but at all places in T, you can put in other conditions that, for example, at, at, at the odd other place, it locally comes from points, so that it really seems more like a Selmer scheme, and so Alex and Nathan have really studied this carefully and have some very beautiful results. So what's meant by that F, in other words, can vary depending on the situation. And I, I, I don't think I've used it very consistently. But people in, in abelian theory, like in Iwasawa theory and block conjectures, those, those kind of 
in those uh, uh, in the theory developed in that direction, they don't use it so consistently either. So I'm allowing myself a lot of latitude. So what do we have now? We have this diagram from the, point, the global points to the local points, then you associate to glo a global point a global torsor and a local point to a local torsor, and together with this localization map is the diagram we mentioned at the beginning. But now, <coughs> uh, remember the way we've set it up, this actually comes from a map of functors. But they are representable, so now you have a map of schemes. So this lower horizontal arrow is really an algebraic map, which replaces the difficult um, inclusion of the global points in local points. And I'm viewing it as a kind of computable replacement of that inclusion. Um, yeah, so actually, maybe one thing. Why do the points map to H1 sub F? It's because this torso of paths for the unipotent uh, completion actually has this Galois invariant point. So this comes from a Pierre de Hodge theory isomorphism, which uh, it's, um, you should black box. <laughs> it's hard to get into here. It's a fairly difficult proof um, that, um, I guess there are many people who prove that it's in different forms. And I, so I can never keep track of it. So I just don't write anything. It's like uh, Vologotsky had something, Martin Olsen had some versions of the theorems and, and so, uh, I, I take no responsibility to give the correct attribution, so this is a fact. <clears throat> no, it's a, um, so if you look at it, the, the, what is this saying? It's saying that if you take the B Chris points of the torsor of path for the etal QP unipotent completion from B to X, that's isomorphic to the B Chris points of the Duran path together with this Hodge filtration and structure. And this is an isomorphism that respects all structures. So, but then this side, uh, this is just isomorphic as a Galois module to be Chris to the end, because remember that was just an affine space. Yeah. And this has a Galois invariant point that gives us a Galois invariant point in uh, the unipot, etal unipotent completion tensor B Chris. So that's why every, thing, every point maps to H1 sub F. It trivializes, the torso trivializes over, F, over B Chris. <clears throat> okay, now let's finally fill in this uh, diagram, this what people have called the cutter. <laughs> so how does this work? So here, again, I'm being kind of very brief. But the point is that if you start with a crystalline torsor in the previous sentence for, for the unipotent fundamental growth, yeah. so remember it has a coordinate ring, it's spec of something, that's what I'm writing as script AT, the ring of functions, the affine coordinate ring of X, <clears throat> then what you can do is you can do a coordinate ring version of this Fontaine's uh, B Chris, uh, D Chris functor. That is, you just take the coordinate ring of T, tensor with B Chris, and then uh, take the Galois invariant. Yeah. So this kind of thing has been studied a lot for vector representations, right? But this work for this, in this non-abelian setting as well. And what you get is are you starting from a torsor for the etal fundamental growth by applying these things to the coordinate ring, you get a torsor for the drum fundamental growth. And you get Hodge filtration, sorry, misspelling, Hodge filtration and Frobenius structure simply coming from B. Chris. So B. Chris has those structure that gives you a structure on uh, the Hodge filtration and Frobenius structure on this torsor as well, defined to be the spectrum of the GP invariant. And then finally, the, the lemma is that this actually gives you an isomorphism between the crystalline torsos for the etal fundamental group and this period domain that represents the uh, Hodge, uh, Hodge crystalline torsos for the drum fundamental group in the manner that we discussed earlier. So we get this isomorphism. Uh, so I, I put at the end of the slide a brief description of why this is an isomorphism, but uh, maybe I won't uh, go over it in the lecture here. But in any case, now we're done setting up the diagram. So this is this uh, box cutter diagram. Where <coughs> all the, all, everything commutes. And then what comes afterwards is just a few remarks on why that last triangle, the bottom, uh, edge of that triangle is an isomorphism. Okay, good. So now let's move on to 
or the, move, in some sense, move back to the first lecture where we discuss how this is used. So I've now cut up, caught up to um, lecture four. Okay. So and I put the diagram back on the board. I think I, I put out some unnecessary explanation up here because I'd originally made a lot of the slides over an arbitrary number field because Nathan and also Brian, uh, sorry, Daniel Hast have figured out how to do this for number fields as well. And now I'll stick to the case over Q. So this is the diagram again. And here, here's a conjecture, I'm calling it conjecture A. The image of this localization map should be non-dense for n sufficiently large. So this follows from a lot of standard motivic conjectures, like the block cutter conjecture, which is also kind of nice conceptually or philosophically, because block cutter conjectures are all generalizations of, B, B, of the Birch and Swindleton diagram conjecture to other varieties and higher codimension cycles and so forth. So that's the way. So they are a, a higher generalization of BSD, and that's what implies that this localization map has a non dense image. And then it follows right away from conjecture A that the rational points have to be finite. So you've all seen this argu argument now, I think, in various forms. I'll just tell you briefly how it goes again. Because if the image is non dense, then there's a function, these are all affine varieties, there's a function that vanishes on the image. Also after applying B because D is an isomorphism, the Fontaine functor is an isomorphism. So in other words, alpha restricted now to the image of localization is, uh, is zero. Uh, so then uh, we can pull that alpha back to the local points of the curve using this map, oh sorry, jade ram up there, this uh, diagonal map. And then, because of the commutativity of the diagram, it has to annihilate the global points. So that's the argument, right? But in fact, uh, that, uh, as mentioned earlier, this function, when you restrict to the global points, is a non-zero convergent power series on each of these residue disks. And these convergent power series have only finitely many zeros. Uh, I think there was an, a question about this earlier. It's, a, it's a, actually an amusing exercise to prove this, why it only has finitely many zeros. So essentially, it's the so-called Weierstrass preparation theorem that power series have, can be the zeros of, it's, a, it's, a, it's essentially a unit times a polynomial, except the Weierstrass preparation theorem is usually stated for uh, integral coefficient power series, right? So you have to modify that slightly to work for, for, to get it to work for convergent power series. But that's that's also an amusing exercise to figure out how that works. So these convergent power series have finitely many zeros. So in each residue disk, there are only finitely many rational points, and so there are only finitely many altogether. Okay. So now let's return to the non-abelian or non-Archimedean, non-Abelian, non-everything, yeah. effective model conjecture mentioned in the first uh, um, lecture. Uh, you're all non-conformists here, I think, so it's okay to talk about a lot of non-things. Um, uh, nonsense as well, yeah, which is... Uh, <laughs> so we define this XQP subscript M. This notation also occurred in, uh, in many lectures. Uh, Jennifer was using it. So uh, what is this? These are, this is the subset of QP uh, annihilated by functions coming from the nth level of the, of the drum fundamental group, this quotient of the drum fundamental group, right? Uh, so consider all possible zero sets coming from all functions, right? So let me, uh, I've, I've written what it is here, but let's, let's go back briefly to the diagram. Right? So the thing is, so if the image is non-dense for a large n, for any fixed n, right, you have functions on here that kill the image. In other words, the defining ideal of the closure of the image, consider all elements in the defining ideal, then they define a zero set up there. Okay? So that's the thing, this QP, XQP subscript n. Okay? So, but as n increases, you get more and more of those, right? So. Uh, <coughs> you get this decreasing filtration of all QP points 
subscript one, subscript two, subscript three, and so on. Right? That subscripting I saw, I, th I think I, I used inconsistently in the past, so sorry about that. <clears throat> but anyways, uh, as mentioned, for a sufficiently large n, actually that's just a finite set, so it looks like a very complicated infinite filtration, but at some point it just becomes a finite set. No? So it can only decrease finitely many times after that. No? And conjecture B is that, in fact, when you, when you go over all n, and therefore at some finite level n, is that this gives you exactly the rational points. No. So uh, we have, I guess, cases where this is true, an increasing uh, sequence of cases where you can prove this. Uh, but it's, um, uh, I think it's hard to imagine how it could not be true. <laughs> you see, you, you keep getting these functions that are algebraically independent from previous functions. That's what that's, uh, I alluded to that later because of the transcendence of this J map. Um, actually, uh, I guess I didn't stress that enough, so sorry, let me go back to the earlier diagram once more. So over here at the bottom row, everything is algebraic, right? But this map is an extremely, the, the map from the local points to this global local moduli spaces, these are highly transcendental map. Yeah? These are all, all the coordinates are algebraically independent. So as you go up and you keep getting algebraically independent al transcendental functions on the periodic points that kill global points. Yeah? So it's hard to imagine that this finite set could survive <laughs> unless it has some real reason to survive, namely being a global rational point. <laughs> So that's uh, what this conjecture is, that the intersection over all n, as you go down the filtration, should be exactly the rational point. And then conjecture C uh, is that this intersection should, in fact, be computable. Okay. So that's the non-Archimedean, non-Abelian effective model conjecture. And you see, it's the ABC conjecture. Yeah. Right. Okay, so that's pretty much, I think, everything of substance <coughs> that I intended to say. So now let's close up by making some comments about what you're supposed to do with these conjectures. <coughs> so first of all, what I view as the really key problem in this theory is understanding the image of the localization map. So there's the, glo the localization goes from the global moduli space of principal bundles to the local one. <coughs> and remember, possibly with more conditions, more Selmer type conditions at primes dividing L. Yeah. So for, uh, for that H1 sub L as, as given or more refined versions, we should try to understand the defining equations inside the local moduli space. Why? Because those defining equations, then when you pull back via this period map, this iterated integral map, give you the equations for uh, cutting out the rational points inside the periodic points. Remember, that's why we want it. So we would like to be able to understand these defining equations in an algorithmic way, be able to produce them somehow. Yeah. <clears throat> and uh, so a very speculative comment is that I, 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 I Part of me keeps feeling like there should be some canonical equations defined by the curve itself. Once you know the curve, it should be possible somehow to, as you go up the over the level Zen, to get a canonical algebraic functions inside the ideal of the image of localization. So this kind of thing is very reminiscent of the theory of L functions, especially as it occurs in U.S. Hall theory. So, one view of, 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 of these uh, periodic L functions result, for example, in the case of elliptic curves. Say, if you look at the rank zero case of, of the BSD conjecture, if you examine carefully, um, so take the theorem that says that if the L, L function doesn't vanish, L function of an elliptic curve doesn't vanish at one, right? Then there should be finitely many points. That's part of the BSD conjecture. Now, the proof of these statements, actually, what it does, it takes the periodic L function, annihilates the points. There's a periodic L function multiple of the canonical differential form that kills the global points on an elliptic curve. Uh, and that multiple is non-zero, and that's why you get finally many points for that case of the BSD conjecture. So what I'm imagining is it would be nice, or at least uh, it, it's... Uh, uh, compelling wishful thinking to hope that there's such a compel canonical equation in this setting. And part of the project 
the goal of, of the project that some of you have been doing is at least examine the, the existing evidence, right? The cases that we know. And uh, I, I, um, so, okay, so maybe it's a tedious exercise for you guys. I don't know. But anyways, I, I'd like to know what kind of patterns come out of the existing equations for the image of localization. Um, so there's also, if you look at the Iwasawa main conjecture, as occurs in a billion or non a billion Iwasawa theory, one also expects things like this inside the supposed homotopy category. Homotopy category meaning what? So you can, it is possible to construct this kind of object as a differential graded algebra. And I, I'm also speculating existence of a theory of non-abelian L function that trivializes that object inside the homotopy category of differential graded algebra. So, in other words, I, I hear this is, as I said, this is a very speculative nonsensical slide. I'm uh, imagining two different analogs of the abelian Iwasawa theory. One is an L function annihilating the image of localization and L, an L function trivializing something like compact support homotopy theoretic homology. So the first statement, uh, so this second statement is sort of like a, a, a non-abelian main conjecture. The first statement is, should be an easier statement. It's similar to Iwasawa's theorem that describes the image of global units inside local units of cyclotomic field. Um, so if, for number theorists who, who, who are interested in any aspect of algebraic number theory, these theorem, these theorems, of course, are things that need to be understood and they're very interesting. So if you look at Iwasawa theorem, this theorem I'm quoting, quoting here, by the way, essentially what it's doing, it, it proceeds by producing a lot of units yeah? Namely, these things called cyclotomic units. They sit inside a finite index subgroups of all units. And you understand the local image of cyclotomic units. That's why you can prove that the local units modulo global units are annihilated by the periodic L functions. So that's was our theorem. So in order to understand the image up there as well, it seems to be necessary to produce a lot of elements inside that global H1 whose local image we can understand. I don't know how to do it. It's very difficult because it's non abelian cohomology. But things that are not just points, uh, one should try to produce it and understand their local image to get this local equations. These are all in the spirit of abelian U.S. Hour theory generalized to this non abelian setting. But uh, I, again, I admit I, I haven't been able to do anything in that direction. Uh, maybe one other remark. In, uh, of a similar so the, considering this question concerning this question of finding this local image is that uh, one thing one can try is consider a finite Galois extension of Q. You can do all this construction up there, right? But in fact, a, fa uh, a nice fact that's an elementary consequence of the definition is that this Selmer scheme over Q, the points especially, actually I'm not sure what happens if you want to do this in a more invariant theoretic way, but if you want to look at the points of the Selmer scheme over Q, it's in fact exactly the points of the Selmer scheme over your number field after taking Galois invariant. It's the fixed points under this finite Galois action of the Selmer scheme over a larger number field. Yeah. So well, you might ask, think that maybe if by choosing these number fields carefully, you can produce more elements in here, lots of points over F, so, so using which you can understand the image of localization over this larger number field and use that and this fixed point expression to understand the Selmer scheme over Q. And you can start with any field and go to an extension to try to do this. So for example, you might consider the cyclotomic tower. So here, I'm not writing this fixed point formula rigorously, yeah. but in some sense, obviously, the, the, the summer scheme over Q, Q is a limit under the Z, under this uh, ZP star action of the summer scheme directly uh, over the cyclotomic field. So that's a, that's a kind of a construction that's dual picture of what you often see in US Hour theory but I'm hoping these constructions can be used to compute the image of localization. Okay, so that's pretty much the substance. So maybe I'll close, since I have 25 more minutes, or maybe a few more since we started a bit late. So uh, I'll, I'll close with uh, some miscellaneous comments. 
So as I said, all substance is done. You can leave, fall asleep, look at your phone, whatever you want. And uh, I'll just make some comments of a scattered nature. <clears throat> so first, I said earlier on that the idea that this leads to an effective determination procedure, um, it can be implemented in many ways. So Jennifer and Nathan and other people have implemented it. Uh, so essentially, how have they implemented it? It's because they, in any instance, it's because they understand the image of localization well enough to identify the point. Yeah. But it's not very systematic, of course. It, you need to be lucky, you know, it's ad hoc. You need a lot of rational points in hand to help you, you know, determine undetermined coefficients and so on. So that's all very hard. So we would like to make this more streamlined. And uh, so one reason why one expects this to work, it comes from the section conjecture, whether you actually, so I'm about to say a bunch of things. I'm not sure that that's the best way to implement this effectivity, but it gives some reason to believe that effectivity should follow. So how does this work? So first I'll lay out the assumption. So first is what I said. Suppose you can effectively compute the image of localization composed with this Fontaine map, right? So that the global cohomology, the Selmer scheme, the image inside this drum period space, suppose it, I'm going to assume that it can be effectively computed. I'll say in a minute how effectively you need to compute it. Well, actually, I'm going to say it right here, sorry. So the point is, by computing that image well enough, one would like to compute an effective lower bound for the periodic distances between rational points. No. So by separating the zeros of the functions you get on the periodic points very well, hopefully you can find, compute a lower bound for periodic distances between rational points by computing lower bound between periodic distances of between zeros. No. So that's what we need to be able to do this by a careful computation. <coughs> Thirdly, from this, actually, you get an effective M yeah. such that, oh, sorry, I should have said, I wrote, I, I alternate between rational points and integral points. Here for this discussion, let's just assume X is compact, so integral and rational are all the same. Yeah. <clears throat> so if you found this, this lower bound for, for the periodic distances between points, then you can find an effective M such that reduction mod P to the M is injective. That's what it means to have separated the points well enough, right? So that's the third step. <clears throat> then using that effective bound, you can also find an effective n such that the points of the Jacobian mod n effectively uh, injects into H1 of the Galois cohomology with coefficients in n, n torsion. No? I, oh, sorry, what did I say? Of course, this is always injective. What I mean is, um, you, you want to find effective M such that XQ, the image of that inside the Jacobian modulo N is injective. The reduction mod N, N is injective, right? Because once you, can, you, once you find N such that NJQ is in, uh, what am I trying to say? Yeah, once you separate the points of xq modulo p to the m, you can also separate it modulo the n multiples of the points of the Jacobian. Yeah, because the points of the Jacobian will be separated modulo p to the m. So this is what we want. Okay, so I, I, I laid down a sequence of four statements, right, that allows us to find an n such that the rational points of x inject into this kind of cohomology. This is a finite group because this is restricted ramification and we're taking finite coefficients. Yes, so you have a finite group into which the points of the curve injected, provided we can carry out all the previous steps. Then finally, we need Grundig's axiom conjecture to finish this story. That is, Grundig's axiom conjecture says that starting from any number field, the map from points to torsors is a bijection if you take the pro-finite pi one, you won't get anything like this for if you consider pro-unipotent pi one. Those things get grow, uh, grow very, very large as you increase n, right? But Grodendieck conjecture is that if you take the pro-finite pi one, there should be an injection, uh, bijection from points 
two choices. So this is, there are many formulations of the vector, vector conjecture. This is the, the useful one for our purposes. Okay. Now, of course, for elliptic curves, there's a system, statement like this. The finiteness of the tetra Friedrich group of P part of it gives you a bijection <coughs> of the Mordavier group tensor QP with that kind of a cohomology. And this is kind of a version of it, except according to Grundig, if you provide it, you you're on a uh, hyperbolic curve uh, and uh, H1, and you're considering profinite coefficient, you don't need any conditions. He's claiming that you are, there should actually be a bijection. <coughs> right. So how do you use this? So what we're going to do is use number four of this injection into H1 together with Grundig section conjecture <coughs> to get effective determination of points. So I'm just going to outline the argument because it's a bit tedious to do it very, very carefully. <coughs> but here's how it goes. So um, a little bit more notation. <coughs> so I'll denote, <coughs> well, G, I guess I've already introduced a lot of this notation. First, we'll take little n to be a number that's larger than, than that big n that just came up in the big n torsion of the Jacobian, and all the primes in S are bad reduction, etc. <coughs> Furthermore, we denote by G subscript n the fundamental group of spec Z 1 over n factorial. <coughs> so these groups, by the way, occurred in this uh, letter from uh, Delin to uh, Dinesh Thakur, when Dinesh asked him about uh, Delin's idea for proving the Mordeaux conjecture from the section conjecture. And Delin admits that he, it fails, but he, he shows certain constructions that's related to the original statement, and this group occurs there. <coughs> I'll denote by delta the geometric pi 1 of x. And kn <coughs> is the intersection of all sub open subgroups of delta of index at most n. Because that's a topologically finally generated group, there are only finally many such subgroups. And because you're taking intersection of all of them, it's normal. Yeah? <clears throat> and delta now, bracket n, is the quotient of delta modulo this kn. So this is some finite quotient of delta. And now it's a minor exercise to show that inside this quotient, the prime divisor of <clears throat> divisors of orders of all elements in this quotient are actually less than or equal to n. That's the way, we, way we've set up this problem. <clears throat> this is a group with the property that any prime device, prime order that occurs in there is less than or equal to n. So uh, then we take this exact sequence involving the arithmetic fundamental group, the geometric fundamental group, and the Galois group of the base, and push it out to that, uh, to that finite quotient of the kernel. <clears throat> so this pi n is just fits into this push out, push out diagram. <clears throat> now then, Another fact is that uh, so this requires a little bit more of the theory of this arithmetic fundamental growth. Once you push this out, because the action of that delta n is unramified outside n factorial, yeah, <clears throat> this diagram can be pulled back from this, quotient, this uh, quotient group Gn of, of extensions unramified outside n factorial. So you get a pullback diagram like this. And where this, this thing in the middle is pi 1 of a model, smooth projective model of x over the spec of z with one factorial inverted. <coughs> now, furthermore, any point in x actually defines, remember, it, originally in the section conjecture, it defines a class of torsors for the profinite pi 1, right? Uh, the non abelian cohomology of the whole Galois group here. Now, with this setup, it actually defines a class with all these restricted ramifications. Why did we do all this? Because this thing now is a finite set. A priori, it's a finite. So every x defines a class in this finite set for every n sufficiently large, as in the previous, discuss, as in the previous slides. <coughs> right. So how do, you care, how do you construct an algorithm out of this? Well, here goes. So that the points of X will inject into this non-abelian commodity. The existence of this injection is, in the, is noted in the paper of Grundig to Faltings. Sorry, the letter of Grundig to Faltings where he formulates the section conjecture. It's essentially because the model V group of the Jacobian is finally generated. That gives you an injection. <coughs> and then, now, once you're there, you can push it out to H1 of the absolute color with coefficients in this finite thing, right? 
But then inside here, you have those classes that come from this restricted ramification Galois group via inflation. So you have this commutative square. <coughs> but then the points of x also map here. That's what I just said, right? So you get this commutative diagram over here. So inside that H1, that big H1 with coefficients in the profinite pi 1, you can well, introduce a subset of those classes, subscript n, consisting of those things that when you push down here, come from that unramified color group, restricted ramification color group. So you get a sequence of subsets <coughs> of uh, that H1 G delta. So um, now to expand that a little bit, so this was our previous diagram, because remember the subscript 10 exactly consists of those things here that come from there, so you get this pullback diagram up there in the square. But this thing then also can be mapped down to our H1 of Gn with coefficients in J and torsion. Because remember, this was a quotient of delta consisting of, well, okay, I'm not going to be able to say it now anymore. <laughs> but anyway, it has this N torsion of the Jacobian as a quotient. Because this is also part of the, it's, it's an abelian quotient of the tau fundamental growth of the right order. So actually, delta N actually has Jn as a quotient. <clears throat> so you can come all the way down here. But then this also has, but via inflation, it has this H1 that we set up at the beginning as a subspace. So uh, uh, the, n now, how does you can make this compatible over, over N? As you increase N, remember you have more ramification here, so you have this inflation here as well as here. <clears throat> and then you have uh, the same thing with delta N plus 1, where you've increased the indices of the subgroups that you construct to construct this quotient, that you use to construct this quotient. So then you have this big diagram. <clears throat> so um, eventually, when you put that together, OK, so you can put, do the rest of the argument yourself, because it will be even more confusing if I try to explain it to you. <clears throat> so inside this H1 of GSJN, which was the finite set that contained the points, right? you have a decreasing sequence of subsets that consists of those classes that lift up via this diagram. Yeah? So these are the classes in here that when you put here, will lift up here. Yeah? And then when you put it at the next level, you have those things that lift up here furthermore. Yeah? So you get a decreasing sequence of subsets. By given by more and more lifting conditions. Again, I can show you this is very similar to the elliptic curve case. On the other hand, <coughs> you can compute at the level of points a sequence of points that are of increasing height. Yeah. <coughs> so you get a larger and larger set of points and a smaller and sub, sub smaller sequence of subsets of this H1. And the, the, the argument that I will not finish <coughs> is that the section conjecture implies that for sufficiently large and these are equal. This follows from the section conjecture. In, a, in an argument that's very similar to this BSC case, the finiteness of the tetra Fravich group argument, section conjecture implies that this increasing sequence of subset meets the decreasing sequence at some point. And as soon as it meets, you know that you have the full set of rational points. So there's a very precise parallel between the BSC argument and the argument here. And remember, the ingredients that go in here are the two non-abelian generalizations of BST. One non-abelian generalization is conjectures of block type. The other is the section conjecture. Uh, and the attitude that I may be somewhat encouraging here, right, which it may be is a, doesn't befit a mathematician, is that proving the conjectures is not so important. <clears throat> Rather, much more important is turning out this whole procedure, this algorithmic procedure, assuming the conjecture into something streamlined. Yeah. So that given any curve, <clears throat> you can carry it out and have at hand an algorithm that conditionally terminates, <laughs> conditional under conjecture. But then when it does terminate, you know that you have the full set of rational points. So I'd like to really turn that procedure into something that's as streamlined as the elliptic curve case. And that's the, that's the highest priority in all this, not proving the conjecture. Because once you can do this, largely the conjectures seem plausible enough. We don't need the proof. Mm -hmm.
<clears throat> Unless you need a million dollars or something like that. That's not that. <laughs> right. Okay. So that's how. Uh, this is kind of the philosophical reason that I expect effectivity to come out of this story. <clears throat> so I'll skip all this now. Um, <clears throat> okay. So uh, I still have ten minutes. <clears throat> so uh, I think I'll be able to finish my slide. So this is the second. Well. It's chapter three, but it's the second scattered comment. There's a kind of story surrounding non-abelian reciprocity laws underlying all this discussion. <clears throat> what do I mean by this? So, um, well, there's reciprocity laws, as you know, occur in class field theory, and that goes, it does go into uh, uh, the arithmetic of conics, right? That's what I said right at the beginning. And when one speaks about non-abelian reciprocity laws in numbers here, normally you mean the Langlands program. So that's one kind of non-abelian reciprocity law, which is obviously important. <coughs> I mean something else here, and something much more direct. What I mean is this. Suppose you take a variety over a number field, right? <coughs> and as I said right at the beginning, you're interested in the way the global points sit inside the adelic points. So there are various local to global principles that people prove and use in this setting. But uh, uh, um, it is regarded as quite hard. It's a hard question, or maybe even a nonsensical question to ask, how do you describe that subset of the global points inside the adelic points? Yeah. So when you first teach about arithmetic of conics to undergraduates, they actually always ask that question, and then we shut them up. That doesn't make sense. But actually, <laughs> I think it does make sense, <clears throat> right? Um, so I think one way of understanding the ordinary reciprocity law of class field theory is it's kind of giving a partial answer to this question when the variety is GM. I don't think that's how you normally look at the reciprocity law, but I think this is an important viewpoint. Because what, does it, what happens in the case of GM? Well, in that case, the adelic points of GM is exactly the group of EDELs. Right? The reciprocity law of abelian class field theory goes from that to the abelian Galois group of F. Right? And then what does the reciprocity law say? It says that, in fact, the global points are inside the kernel of the reciprocity law. So it is a statement of Diophantine geometry, although one doesn't always look at it that way. Um, you might know that when you do this over function fields, in fact, rather than number fields, the kernel is the reciprocity law. The kernel of the reciprocity map is exactly the global points in that sense. So the global reciprocity law gives you a group-valued map that gives you an exact defining equation for the global points inside the, the adelic points. That's quite striking. That work, it works that way for, for function fields because of the real places. It doesn't quite work that way for number fields, but still, it's interesting that you, can, you should think of the reciprocity law as giving a defining equation for this almost nonsensical seeming question for the, for the curve GM, variety GM. <clears throat> you can do something similar for affine conics. I want to explain this a little bit. You can look at the slide later and try to figure out what I meant there. Um, so, how, uh, <laughs> so again, so the point is, this is uh, continuing the nonsensical question. Can you do this for other varieties? And the answer is that you can. It's not very useful, but you can do it. And this, at least for me, was a bit of a surprise. I'm going to simplify a little bit here because you need some conditions on, on cohomology of the Galois group with coefficients in various graded pieces of the geometric fundamental group of X for this to be literally true. But even in the, when those conditions aren't satisfied, you can make this complication, this, uh, this whole discussion more complicated and get a version of this. So I'll just tell you the simple story. With some conditions on cohomology, what happens is that you can start with a general variety and regard it as coefficients for class field theory. GM are the usual coefficients for class, the abelian class field theory. But now just like, take any variety and regard it as coefficients for class field theory. Meaning what? <clears throat> take the adelic points, right? And it turns out that there's a filtration of the adelic points. I've denoted x sub 1, x sub 2, x sub 3. I think this is where the inconsistent notation comes in. With the previous discussion, I think the adelic points was x sub 0. But anyways, let's not be bothered by that right now. You get a filtration. 
And these filtrations have the property that at every level, there's a more and more refined reciprocity map from this set to a group. Well, it, it's a group. This ends up being a group. The group nature doesn't seem to be so important. The important thing is that this is a pointed set. Of course, a group is a pointed set. And the way this works is that the kernel of the reciprocity map, that is the inverse image of the origin on the dense reciprocity map, is the next level of the filtration. And at that level, you get another reciprocity map. So you keep going in this manner. So you get a sequence of more and more refined reciprocity maps with coefficients in this general variety. And this is quite interesting, and, but it's very hard to study, so I haven't done anything with it after defining this, uh, this uh, filtration. <clears throat> but there is a, so, okay, so I've set up the diagram like this. So somehow, you know, the whole adelic lines, there's a subspace consisting of the kernel, the zeroth reciprocity map, and you get another reciprocity, a second reciprocity map, its kernel, uh, is, uh, has the third reciprocity map and so on. So you get a more and more refined sequence of subspaces. And the reciprocity law, in fact, <coughs> is that the rational points of the variety itself right, is actually in the infinite kernel. So this is actually, it's, I'm making it sound much more complicated or deeper than it is, but I think it's still very interesting because this is genuinely a non-abelian generalization of Artin reciprocity. Artin reciprocity is disdainment for GM. For GM, it stops at n equals 1 because there's no, it has to do with the, the non-abelian nature of the fundamental growth, but um, still, it is a genuine generalization that works for uh, many reasonable varieties, for example, curves of higher genus. Yeah. And uh, the conjecture uh, is another version of the earlier conjecture is that when X is a smooth projective curve of genus at least two, then when you take this infinite kernel of the reciprocity map and project to the periodic points, they should again be exactly uh, the rational points, the global points. Yeah. So yeah, it gets, I wrote QP, this should be FV or something, right? For, for uh, a little bit inconsistent notation. It's a completion of, of F. Okay, so that's another version of the earlier conjecture. But um, the idea that you should look at non abelian reciprocity in this way, I think, anyways, is an interesting and important one. That, uh, and, anyways, to go back to the beginning of these comments that the reciprocity law should be viewed as a statement of Diophantine geometry and generalized that way. I think it's worth thinking about. Okay, so that's the next comment. So finally, uh, actually maybe there's one other comment that I'll make, which, because there was a question in relation to this earlier. So remember, uh, so I forgot to make those slides, so I'll just say it in words. But I, there was something on my mind I kept saying I should say it at some point, and I kept forgetting. Uh, so as we said, when in the case of GM, it only has an abelian fundamental group. So this whole story degenerates quite a bit, right? But uh, for those of you who have very abstract inclinations, right, you can try to ask yourself, how do we generalize the, all the discussions we've had so far to spaces that have simple fundamental groups? For example, simply connected spaces. None of this works, of course, right? Now, not, not only simply connected spaces, actually the situation is worse than that. For most higher dimensional Shimura varieties, for example, this unipotent completion is zero because of this, this uh, the, the, their fundamental groups tend to be lattices inside reductive groups. And in that situation, you put the fundamental groups tend to be zero. So you have to, you could use, try to use other fundamental groups. That's one kind of strategy. But even if you have no fundamental groups at all, what are we really interested in? We're interested in what, uh, how the, uh, what were we doing? We were encoding points into homotopy classes of paths, right? From a fixed base point to X. Or we might say we're interested in the fundamental groupoid together with some Galois action, right? as encoding the points and allowing us to construct families of objects, moduli spaces or principal bundles that are better behaved than points in some sense, using which we can try to cut out the points. So that was the strategy. But now there's a lot of fancy homotopy theory, even for simply connected varieties, right? That allows you to study variation of objects with respect to points, various categories. I mean, for example, higher homotopy groups is one thing, but there are many other variants of these days with the advent of 
higher stacks, derived geometry, and so on. So I think there are some of you who are interested in very abstract machinery. Yeah? So you, could, you can also think about simply connected varieties where you can study the variation of higher objects of homotopy theoretic types and use that to study points. Okay, I think I essentially used up my time, but I only have a few slides left, so I'll just finish because these are very easy slides. You don't even need to concentrate because uh, this actually fits in very well with uh, uh, Bass's defense of the Jacobian. I also like the Jacobian, by the way. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, because you see, this whole story that I'm describing here in my lecture actually arose from the study of the Jacobian in many ways, but in a, in a path uh, along a, a path that's maybe not often appreciated very much, right? Because remember, when Vey constructed the Jacobian in his thesis, so he constructed it as an abelian variety of dimension G. That is, <coughs> it's an algebraic variety. And that was the point. Because earlier construction, there were complex analytic construction of the Jacobian in the 19th century, but they weren't algebraic. <clears throat> but why did he construct it algebraically? Because, well, he, well, first of all, from our modern point of view, it's an algebraic variety because it's a moduli space of line bundles. That's one way of interpreting it. But the point was that rational points of the curve mapped to the rational points of the Jacobian. And then this formed a finally generated abelian group. So that's what he proved in his thesis. Right? And he thought you could use that somehow to understand the points on the curve. But that turned out to be very hard, as most of you know. Because the curve isn't an abelian group, but this finally generated abelian group that might have infinitely many points doesn't, didn't seem to help too much in studying the points of the curve. So about 10 years later, so they uh, considered the following variant. What he did was, he considered the moduli space of vector bundles over the curve and thought of it as a non-abelian Jacobian. So the title of the, of, the, of the paper is generalization of abelian functions, meaning theta functions, right? And he thought somehow studying this moduli space should give a kind of tool for studying points on the curve while avoiding the proliferation of points that arise from an abelian group. So that's the goal that he states right at the beginning of the paper. He's actually very interested in the Mordell conjecture at this point. And uh, it doesn't work, but this, this construction is very important and it influences a lot of subsequent developments in geometry, in algebraic geometry, the theory of moduli, Hodge theory, non-abelian Hodge theory, and so forth. So I've said a few, uh, just mentioned a few of the subsequent developments here. So Serre, in the obituary, or Vey's obituary, claims that this paper is very important. He says there's a text presented as analysis because of functions, right? whose significance is essentially algebraic, meaning algebraic geometric, but whose motivation is arithmetic, meaning the Mordell conjecture. That's what he was interested in at that time. <clears throat> then he says, Serre goes on to say that Vey was ahead of his time because nobody knew the proper geometric invariant theory and so forth to implement his idea of using this to study points on the curve. Now, in that, Serre is not correct because uh, now we have all the geometric invariance theory. We want to construct these moduli spaces as coarse moduli space, algebraic stacks, and whatnot. But nobody has succeeded in using these moduli spaces to study points on curves. It might be possible to do it, and I do have some ideas on how you might do such a thing, but nobody's done it. Nobody's actually used this. Uh, uh, algebraic geometry construction of moduli of non-abelian bundles to study points. Instead, one went in other directions. Yeah? Instead of looking at the algebraic construction, we actually went back to the analytic construction, where the Jacobian then can be thought of extensions of mixed Hodge structures, which then generalizes to spaces of torsors and admit non-abelian generalizations in Hodge theory that was studied very carefully by Dick. Uh, so this is a very important paper, but people don't cite it too much, right? <laughs> he looked at Steve D did he do the higher? But did, did you write about this first, and then you developed it with Zucker? I forgot. Yeah. Anyways, OK, yeah, sorry. <laughs> anyway, so, so over uh, this, uh, this idea of generalizing this x group construction of the, of the, to the non-abelian case first occurs in Hodge theory in Hain and Hain and Zucker's paper. Then, over QP, we have our unipotent Albanese maps and classifying spaces for torsors. Okay. 
So oh, that's it. Uh, this is a summarizing in one, one slide everything I've said so far. But it's interesting that all we are trying to do is finding the appropriate analog of Jacobians in this story. So it's really not, uh, you don't have, the Jacobian doesn't need defending. Uh, we've given it plenty of respect already. Okay, well, thank you very much for your patience. Uh, so I think in view of the time, we'd better break for lunch and defer the questions that you have for Minyoung to the lunch hour. But let's give him another big round of applause for the great episodes. Uh, we'll resume at 2.30.